Hi, Gigi from the RBA. In this video on economic growth, we're going to talk about gross domestic product, or GDP. First, let's hear a bit about economic growth. Economic growth refers to how the size of an economy changes over time, and the size of an economy is generally expected to increase over time. When most people hear the term economic growth, they think of gross domestic product, or GDP. GDP is the most well-known method used by economists to measure the size of the economy, and the change in GDP over time is often referred to as economic growth. Now, GDP measures the total production of goods and services in the economy. Breaking down the name can help you to remember this. The G for gross means total. The D for domestic means within an economy. An economy is just a group of individuals, which we usually define by a geographic area. An economy could be a state, a country, a group of countries, or even the whole world. And finally, the P for product means the production of goods and services. Now, there's three different me methods which are used to measure GDP. These are called the production, income, and expenditure methods. In Australia, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, or ABS, is responsible for measuring GDP. They do this four times a year, or once a quarter. The ABS collects data from many sources, in particular via surveys of households and businesses. They then use all of this data to come up with GDP. You might be wondering why we need three measures of GDP. You've probably only ever seen one measure on the news, and even in most of the RBA's publications. Well, the issue is that the ABS can't measure the production of every good and service in the economy, because this would take too long. As a result, it can only estimate GDP using the data that it collects. The different measures of GDP are three separate ways to measure the same thing. Having three separate ways to measure the same thing allows the ABS to cross-check that it's arriving at a reasonable estimate. Let's talk a bit more about these measures. The first one I'll talk about is GDP expenditure, or GDPE. This is the measure you'll see the most. GDPE captures all of the spending on final goods and services by households, businesses, and the government. GDP income, or GDPI, measures the total income generated by households and businesses in the process of producing goods and services. For households, the largest component of this is their wages. For businesses, this is their profits. Both of these are adjusted for the taxes and subsidies on the production of goods and services. And finally, GDP production, or GDPP. GDPP measures total value added in the economy. What is value added? Well, think about when you produce something. You take some inputs and you use them to make some outputs. If you make a sandwich, you take some ingredients, which are the inputs, and assemble them into the sandwich, which is the output. GDPP measures the extra value you create by producing something. In the case of the sandwich, it's the value added by turning a bunch of ingredients into someone's lunch. Importantly, in GDPP, you don't count the value of the inputs used to produce the output. This is because these inputs are the output of someone else. For the sandwich, someone else produced the ingredients. They baked the bread, they grew the salad, etc. And so that's counted as their value add, so we won't count it again in ours. Let's look at another example. Let's imagine there's an economy that consists of an apple tree with five apples on it. We will call this the apple economy. We can use the apple economy to show how the three different types of GDP are measured. So imagine that I own the apple tree, and you come along and you're really hungry. And so I sell you the five apples on the tree for $5. That would be GDP E, the money that you spend on the apples. And so in the process of that, you've given me $5. It doesn't cost me anything to grow the apples, the tree is already there, and the sun and the rain that are needed to grow the apples is free. So my profit from selling you the apples is $5, and that's GDPI. In the process of growing the apples, I've also generated $5 worth of output. So those are the five apples that were grown. Uh, the only inputs that I've used are the sun and the rain, which as I said are free, so their value is zero. So this means the value added from producing the output, apples is $5. So the $5 of output minus $0 of inputs. That would be GDPP. So obviously this example is very simple. For one, it's rare to produce something where the inputs don't cost anything, 
And the example also ignores things like the expenditure multiplier, which we discuss in another video. But it's useful to show how one transaction, you buying five apples from me, can give rise to our three different measures of GDP. So now we're comfortable with the different ways the ABS measures GDP. And as I said before, because these are all estimations, they'll always be slightly different. To calculate official GDP, which is the number you'll hear about, the ABS takes the average of these three measures, and this is called GDP A. This chart shows the growth of GDP under each of these three measures. This is year-ended growth, which means that we're looking at how GDP changed in one quarter compared to the same quarter one year ago. The takeaway from this chart is that the different measures of GDP are normally all a bit different from each other because they're all estimates. Occasionally, the differences can be large, especially when the movements in GDP are large, and that's why we take an average of these three measures. The average of these three measures is the line on this chart, which is from the chart pack on the RBA's website. This line is real GDP growth, or growth in the volume of goods and services produced by the economy. This is the measure of GDP you're most likely to hear about on the news and see in RBA publications. There's a related video that discusses what a real measure of an economic variable is, and you can find a link to this in the description. So far in this video, we've talked about what GDP does measure. But what about the things that GDP doesn't measure? It's important to be aware of these things too, because they impact the economy, even if they're not captured in GDP. So for one, GDP doesn't measure the time we spend doing domestic activities, like cooking, cleaning, or caring for children. These activities are important, and this is something some people consider to be a shortcoming of GDP, because if you pay someone else to do these activities, it is included in GDP. The problem with including domestic activities in GDP is that it's difficult to measure them. I bet that you don't count how many hours a week you cook or clean, and also how would we ascribe value to your cooking versus my cooking if you're a better cook than me? When money changes hands, the measurement is much easier because the money is what captures the value of the service performed. Another issue with GDP is that it doesn't measure the individual welfare of people. There's a common phrase that GDP doesn't measure happiness, which is definitely true, but then again, it's not designed to measure happiness. One thing with GDP to consider is that if the population grows faster than the economy, then the growth in GDP per person, which is also called GDP per capita, would be negative. This chart shows the growth in real GDP versus real GDP per capita each quarter. So GDP is on the top panel and GDP per capita is on the bottom. You can see that growth in GDP is mostly higher than GDP per capita because Australia's population has generally increased over time. Occasionally, you can see that growth in GDP per capita is negative. In fact, for two quarters in a row at the end of 2018, GDP, growth in GDP per capita was negative, even as growth in GDP was positive. At the time, some people called this a per capita recession. Another thing related to individual welfare is that GDP doesn't tell us anything about how evenly the income is distributed among the population, a concept which is called inequality. For example, imagine two scenarios, one where everyone in Australia earned the same income and another where one person earned all the income in Australia. GDP I would be the same in both of these instances, despite these two versions of Australia being very different. And finally, GDP is a flow, not a stock, and this means that GDP sometimes measures things in ways that you might not expect. People use the stock flow language often, which is why I've introduced it to you, but I think it can be confusing, so let's look at an example. So imagine that you have a river, and this river supplies water to a lake. So the river is the flow of water, and the lake is the stock of water. GDP is comparable to the amount of water that flows through the river and into the lake over a period of time. The water in the lake is everything of monetary value that exists in the economy. All of our possessions, homes, buildings, roads, other assets, etc. So GDP doesn't measure the size of the lake and it also doesn't measure any water that disappears from the lake, say because it was evaporated by the sun or someone took it out. Now, what this means is that there's some things that don't make us better off, which can increase GDP. Take, for example, the bushfires in 2019-2020, where a number of people tragically lost their homes. 
You can think of that destruction as water disappearing from the lake. So by itself, this doesn't change GDP, even though it's made the country worse off. However, these people will need to rebuild their homes, right? The process of rebuilding these homes would be considered part of GDP because it's the production of a new good, a new house. In our example, it's the new water flowing through the river to replace the old water that disappeared from the lake. So the rebuilding of homes because of the bushfires would actually increase GDP, even though it's resulted from a natural disaster and caused a great number of people hardship. So I'll leave it there for our introduction to GDP. In a related video, I'll talk more about how we can analyze GDP using a demand and supply framework. Some useful links, including to related videos, are in the description. See you next time.